South Florida. This is Headliners, only on CBS News Miami. Hello everyone, welcome to Headliners. I'm Elliot Rodriguez. It was an emotional week for families of the victims of the deadly Surfside tragedy. Families, friends, and elected officials gathered for memorial service to celebrate the lives of those lost during the Champlain Towers collapse and keep the memory of their loved ones alive. 98 people died in the collapse of the Champlain Tower South Condo in Surfside. Since that devastating morning, one question has loomed large. Why did this happen? Investigators locally and federally are working to try to get an answer to that question and figure out how to use the information to prevent another tragedy. CBS News Miami's Ted Scouten explains how. When the Champlain Tower South collapsed a year ago, the investigation into what happened began almost immediately. Every single person on our team is driven by finding out what happened so that something like this never happens again. Judith Mitrani Reiser is the co-lead federal investigator with the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, known as NIST. We have nearly two dozen hypotheses that we're looking at um, in earnest, all of them. We haven't thrown anything out. In a public update, co-lead investigator Glenn Bell discussed a few of those theories. Some of the hypothesis related work that the geotechnical team is undertaking includes the magnitude and distribution of any settlements or other movements of the foundation, the impact of adjacent construction, especially that of the 87 Park building to the south, and any impact of climate change and tidal actions which may have caused buoyancy uplift on the foundation. NIST investigators say they're about to begin a critical phase, what's known as invasive testing of things like concrete and rebar taken from the site. Most of these tests involve um, taking cores out of those specimens um, so that we can crush them and get compressive strength of uh, the concrete. We are also planning to do tensile um, stress tests on the steel bars, and we'll also need to cut those. They'll use the results of those tests to build 3D models. The materials testing gives us information of the conditions of those materials at the time of collapse. So you can update all of those computer based models with the conditions after 40 years of, a life, of the lifetime of this building, right? So then, then you can test different hypotheses. Obviously, you look at things like foundations. Are there any issues with the foundations? Are there any issues with the columns at different levels of the building? Are there any additions with the slabs and the girders and all that stuff? Engineer Alan Kilsheimer is investigating for the city of Surfside. He too will build 3D models for interactive testing. He, like NIST, is laser focused on finding out what brought that building down. The chances are that what we'll end up finding is it was several things. Each independently might not have caused the problem, but when they all were happening at the same time, that's what caused the problem. Ted Scouten, CBS News, Miami. A South Florida family remembers their matriarch killed when the Champlain Tower South came down. Hilda Noriega was 92 years old, living alone in the Champlain Tower South when part of the structure fell to the ground. CBS News Miami's Nicole Lawrence spoke with Hilda's grandson, who shares her story and details the items they found at the collapse site. Sorry, it's, it's, it's tough to relive this. It's a day still tough for Michael Noriega to describe. A day his grandmother's building collapsed to the ground while she and many others were sound asleep. People on the balcony shouting that they are trapped. I found out because my dad had gotten a phone call from my grandmother's neighbor right across the hall from her. Noriega's father, chief of the North Bay Village Police Department, was the first family member to arrive on scene. Barely able to speak to his son, what he did say left Michael in utter disbelief. He was in complete shock. But he had said, oh my gosh, the building is gone. Noriega and other family members rushed over one by one, each trying to grasp what had happened. It took hours really to realize that this is not a nightmare that we're going to wake up from, but rather this is our new reality that we have to live with. Standing beside the debris, Noriega described the site as catastrophic, a scene out of a movie. Clothing, photos, beds, and other personal belongings scattered everywhere. And I literally just fell to my knees out of shock. I just started crying out to God. 
God, how could this be real? How could this happen? What happened? Just a million questions. Noriega and his family surrounded themselves with love and prayer and their faith guided them to belongings they never thought they would find. We weren't looking for anything. It wasn't until my father initially found that birthday card and that we started to notice that, hey, there's personal belongings everywhere on the street, here on the pool deck. Let's see what else we can find. Noriega's father found this birthday card written to his mother from her friends. They also found these two photos, one of Hilda and her husband, the other of Chief Noriega as a child with his parents. And that's not all. The family also stumbled upon this prayer that reads, bless this house with the Noriega family penned at the bottom. Those items are now, they're irreplaceable treasures that are invaluable to us. For days, the family anxiously waited for news as first responders sorted through the rubble. Hilda Noriega was the 12th person to be identified. Michael remembers the moments first responders notified them, handing over a paper bag. We found this on her, and they handed us a brown paper bag, and within the brown paper bag was six different rosaries. Michael says it's no surprise his grandmother most likely fell asleep praying like she always did. A woman, he says, was simply larger than life. She was such a generous person. She was never stingy with love. She absolutely lived for her faith, her family, her friends. Hours, days and weeks have dragged on for Michael, still with no answers as to what happened on June 24th, 2021. My grandmother didn't die. She was killed. And the same goes for 97 other innocent souls that perished that night. But rather than living with a broken heart, Noriega has learned to carry his grandmother's legacy and inspire others. Don't worry, Fima. Focusing on time. Time is so unforgiving. Time we can never get back. And I never got to say goodbye to my grandmother. I never got that last hug that I always thought that I would have. I never got that last, I love you, Kima. And she would say, I love you more. Nicole Lauren, CBS News, Miami. And now this week's all new Miami Proud is the second of two we've put together for you tied to the Surfside collapse one year later. Last week we brought you the story of two rabbis, both police chaplains and the important role they played following the tragedy. The support they offered survivors and first responders was immeasurable and it has a ripple effect and one that you could only imagine. CBS News Miami's news anchor Lauren Pastrana explains. Police chaplains stood with the families through the entire search and recovery process. What happened in Surfside was incomprehensible. It's easier to accept when a car crash happens and somebody passed away in a car crash versus to a building collapse and there were so many possibilities for survivors, no family is going to fix it. Many of the families of the 98 victims built a bond with these volunteers. Just this Mother's Day, Rabbi Harlig got a call. She last him Mother's Day we were in the apartment in Surfside. And I'm, I can't even look at the pictures. And they still call us because we were part of the circle. To be in a room with all the families, they know you by your first name, you know them by their first name, you notice them every day, they know everything about you, you know everything about them. One young man who lost his father is about the age of Rabbi Rosenberg's kids. And one of the children, he's 20, called me up and he says, I don't have my father this year, Yom Kippur. He says, I don't know where to go. It's the most important day. And I said, you want to come to me? And he came to us. The relationship born during unspeakable pain led to Rabbi Rosenberg meeting this young man again on a recent trip to Israel. The role of chaplain is complex. And sometimes they ask us to officiate at their weddings. They call us for friendship, going through divorce, a family member passed away. They're involved in police memorial ceremonies and graduations, homicide scenes, or other instances of police in trouble. It's less about the religion and more about support. We have Jewish chaplains, Christian chaplains, Catholic chaplains, and we're going to call upon each other. So if I can make it to a hospital in a certain area, I'm going to look at my database and see who I have. And that Christian chaplain would be very happy to go out and bring kosher food to someone in the hospital and vice versa. So we always look out for each other. And then there was Surfside. The world was watching. The departments were watching. So many different agencies, as you know, from all over came down here. And I think that people realized, wow, it's amazing what 
chaplains do. Pinecrest police chief reached out to enlist Rabbi Harlig. If God forbid is a, a challenge, I want my officers to have that experience. Beyond the catastrophes, many departments recognize having chaplains at the ready is valuable to police work. Instead of de-escalating a situation, it usually prevents a situation from happening. Lauren Pastrana, CBS News, Miami. When headliners return, see how South Florida celebrates a longtime nurse who helped save lives while breaking barriers. From South Florida, this is Headliners, only on CBS News, Miami. Welcome back to Headliners. I'm Elliot Rodriguez. As rents soar and affordable housing becomes hard to find, thousands of people are struggling to keep a roof over their heads. Now a step in the right direction as Broward County tackles a tenant bill of rights. CBS News Miami's Joe Murray joins us from Oakland Park with more on how this latest move is helping Broward residents. I can't pay but one box a day. Cancer survivor Katie Adderley has called this place home eight years, but when her landlord told her he was raising her rent by more than $500 a month, she knew she had to move. It was so shocking. I said, 1900 April 1st is, our, you know, and it was just too much for me at one time. With the average South Florida rent rising more than 50% in a year, people are moving out. Broward County followed Miami-Dade's lead and recently passed a tenant bill of rights, which requires landlords to inform renters of their rights, give 60 days notice on a rent increase, and be upfront about their late fees. It's a start. And the advocacy group Florida Rising said they will not stop with that. They'll be pushing commissioners to establish a tenant advocacy office, provide legal help, and require landlords to follow the law. Landlords have no accountability, you know, no consequence, but renters have all of that. Broward Commissioner Nan Rich, who took the lead on the Tenant Bill of Rights, said long term the solution is more affordable housing with rents reflecting a person's income. We're looking right now to try and create a, uh, a dedicated source of revenue to build. It won't happen soon enough for Katie Adderley, who thought she was doing everything right, always paying her rent on time. I thought he should give me some time to know that I'm, my rent is going to be raised, you know, but he didn't. Joan Murray, CBS News, Miami. A celebration of more than 50 years saving lives at Memorial Hospital in Miramar. Emergency room nurse Barbara Williams is calling it a career. CBS News Miami's Hank Tester has her reflection of her decades of helping others, the barriers she broke along the way, and the impact she's had on many more. David. Yes, ma'am. Do you think we can look at this patient because something's going on in there and I'm not exactly sure what? Barbara Williams being Barbara Williams. So why do we have all these chairs like this many? Barbara Williams is in charge of emergency room quality control at Memorial Hospital Miramar. A registered nurse, she makes sure everything runs smooth for patients and employees. We want to improve some things in the emergency department so that it'll be better for you guys. There is history, experience, and perspective here. Barbara Williams has been with Memorial Health Care System for a long time. I've worked since 1969, September 22nd. Which makes Barbara the longest serving employee in the hospital system. Add to that the first woman of color to be a nurse leader in Memorial's history. When Memorial did open, you know, in 1953, it was segregated somewhat, you know, the bathrooms and all of those type of things. So when I came to Memorial, that was no longer. Over the years, Barbara went from being a $2 an hour employee, picking up her nursing degree, work in emergency rooms, and spreading her philosophy that co-workers embrace. She has taught us a lot of not only are you going to give great quality care, but you're going to make sure that your environment is top notch. Lessons that Latanya Moffat will put to good use as she's going to replace Barbara Williams. Yes, Barbara Williams is set to retire. Time to go, she says. I think that it's time to pass the baton to someone else. Hank Tester, CBS News, Miami. 
When Headliners returns, meet the four-legged heroes who comforted first responders during the Surfside tragedy. From South Florida, this is Headliners, only on CBS News Miami. Welcome back to our show. I'm Elliot Rodriguez. It's one of the most dangerous jobs there is, yet every day thousands of officers suit up and face the unknown. At the Miami-Dade Police Department, hundreds of officers are women. And as CBS News Miami's Ashley Dyer shows us in this exclusive report, they go above and beyond to make sure they're ready to handle anything that might come their way. To anyone who's ever thought women aren't as tough as men, think again. You can't say, oh, I'm a girl, time out. Let me get a guy to come take you into custody. You, you gotta figure it out real quick. Meet the ladies of Miami-Dade Police. Us women, we hold our own, we're good. This is how they train. Down up, one, down up, two, down up, three. I started five uh, about three years ago. Five stands for female involvement in violent encounters. I think it helps a lot with, you know, women empowerment of how doing this job. It's a very uh, male based job, so it's good to have a lot of women out here helping each other out. Quickly, let's go, let's go. You're bleeding, you're bleeding, you're bleeding, you're bleeding. Let's go, quickly, quickly. I know they want to train, so why not have it, you know, where women are with each other, supporting each other, helping each other, and that throughout that process is where they're just at their best. Here we go, ready? The week-long class focuses on shooting skills, <laughs> defensive tactics, Six, and everyday encounters. Now the girls are putting all of those movements you just watched together. Footwork, blocking, and striking. It gives them that confidence. Like That's the biggest thing, and it shows and it proves how great they can be. I gave it a try. So what you want to do is spend the least amount of time making contact with the pads. And after a few corrections to really get a hold of. And elbows tight. And so elbows now, tight. What you want to do is generate the power from your knee and bring it up. I was feeling pretty confident myself. If I didn't have this, it would hurt. Especially with this move. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Good power. Good power. <laughs> we do a lot of, you know, DT, which is defensive tactics. So it teaches us women how to deal with, you know, stronger, bigger men when we're out there. Vanessa Uribe says the skills she learned in five training once saved her life. The one time that I can't remember the most was a male who was about 264 pounds and he was 6'3", 6 6'4", 6 and I ended up getting on top of him using all the controls, the strikes that I learned here. A class by women for women. Ashley Dyer, CBS News, Miami. During the tragedy in Surfside, service animals and therapy dogs were brought in to comfort first responders. Now a partnership with the Canines for Warriors program has donated a permanent Surfside police station dog. CBS News Miami's Jacqueline Quinn has that story. What happened a year ago, uh, a lot of us are kind of like re-remembering again. Uh, obviously the tarp that got put up with all the names is, uh, is uh, we remember, you know, how many, how many people were lost that day. The idea of a police station dog was born out of the tragic circumstances of the Surfside collapse. I can tell you, uh, just this morning, uh, I had a meeting with one of my sergeants and one of my detectives. Uh, that meeting was, um, was kind of stressful. Mike was in the room. Mike got up, nobody saw him, Mike got up, sat down next to the sergeant and put his head, she had her hand on the armchair and put his head up to her, her hand. Mike is a four-year-old golden doodle who has a certain knack for sensing anxiety. During the collapse, right after it happened, we started talking about, as a staff about having some, some support dogs come in and we brought some in from the local area. After several discussions, Canines for Warriors, a program that rescues and trains dogs for veterans with PTSD or injury, found Mike. He's a retired service dog. 
Now trained is Officer Mike, a police station dog. We were talking about how we could help with a dog, and ultimately we decided to do a station dog, and we're just only honored to be able to take a little bit of the magic of what a service dog can do for one person and, and share it with the entire community here in Surfside. Officer Mike came to the Surfside Police Department in February. We get stopped all the time by residents and visitors and children that want to pet Mike and interact with him, which is great, which is what we want. He's not just cute. K9 for Warriors tells us he's a therapy dog through the American Kennel Club. He provides relief, love, laughter, and at times a distraction. So when an officer walks in, he interacts with the officer, the officer pets him, and you, you, you can see the smile on the officer. You can almost, you can almost see the, the de-stress. And this week, Officer Mike's support and comfort will go far to help the community heal. Jacqueline Quinn, CBS News, Miami. Thanks for joining us this half hour on Headliners. And as always, keep it right here to CBS News Miami for up-to-the-minute breaking news and weather 24 hours a day. Make it a great day.